And we're live. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Good Welcome afternoon. back. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad we're back. <laughs> yeah, it's been a, it's been a, almost a week, I think. Yeah. This time we we had some uh, hard time finding a similar free time together. And uh, in five days, you've got the the pitch. That's correct. It's happening on Tuesday, and just yesterday evening, I also had another, let's say coaching like that last coaching with the person responsible for the talk mm -hmm. we had a half an hour chat um got also some feedback there great but uh yeah it's, it's happening in five days already <laughs> yeah very cool i'm curious to hear what the feedback was from this uh, coach who's coaching all of the people who are pitching alongside you right um there were two coaches this time oh, uh, mm -hmm. yeah and uh so he had seen three people before me i was the fourth person he was seeing mm -hmm. Overall, he was, he said that like he's impre impressed with everyone and like, it's very great. He thinks everyone is a winner. And I think he's <laughs> right. All of us being there are winners. So that's true. Mm -hmm. um, um, strangely enough, I got quite a lot of positive feedback. Um, but I think the, the, the main uh, problem was he, he thought that I'm not making the problem. No, how to say it? Like the solution very impactful. Like I can't, I haven't been able to show that how this solution is going to like change the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's all like, I'm just like saying there is a solution. This is cool, but like, this is going to like change your life and it's going to like save people's life. You know, something like that. Like he was looking okay. for that kind of touch on it. Mm -hmm. But I think if I give the, the talk to you once again, now you might see like, yeah, it is maybe need some room for improvement in those areas as well. Okay. Yeah, let's jump into it. You were telling me before we started that you have t done 21 um, yeah, practice, 22 now already. Fantastic. So I think that's great. I, I think I might have told you that I think 30 to 40 uh, before a talk is, is what you should aim for. So right. You've got five more days. You can do another 10 to 20 practice um, uh, pitches and then uh, you'll be super ready for it. Yeah. Um, so here's your chance to do number 23. <laughs> you were very right though. Like the practice does help. Like, and you're, they said that while you're practicing, my mind starts to like connecting dots while yeah. I'm giving you talk, like because you have already memorized some parts of it. Yeah. But then when I decide to add something to it or change it, then the whole thing has to start from the beginning. Yeah. Which is, but, but you, you'll notice that um, even when you start to change things, there'll still be sentences or little bits and pieces that still come come through because and you remember them from old versions and mm -hmm. they just seem to flow much better. Instead, if you keep changing the talk and but without ever speaking it, then when you start speaking it out loud, it still won't fit very well. So that's that's the, kind of the danger that I see. A lot of people do that. They write a talk, they're not happy with it. They rewrite it. They rewrite it again. Mm -hmm. They re they spend you know they do twenty different rewrites and then they start giving the talk and they're like, wait, this is crap. What, what, why have I spent so much time rewriting it and it's still not any good? And then they think they did the the writing part wrong and they go back and they write more like uh -huh. the wrong thing. Like <laughs> writing will not make you a better speaker. So it's about speaking. So. Um, the, the fact that you have also come to points where you completely restructure the talk, well, that's part of the, the, the process. Uh, and, and you get to those points when you keep speaking it and stuff just doesn't fit and then you, you know, redo it and you completely change the, the structure maybe. And then you do it again and again, and, and you start to eventually kind of, you know, it's like hill climbing. <laughs> mm, <laughs> it's like a true. computer science metaphor. You are, uh, you, you, you have the, you know, the, the map of possible, um, talks and, and there's certain peaks somewhere and. And what you do when you when you practice is you always hill climb, right? You always go a little bit better, a little bit better. But at some point, you'll you'll hit a local maximum, and then you'll be you'll you look around, you go, "Crap, this is not that good yet." There's probably a bigger peak somewhere else. But first, to get there, you have to go you have to go down the hill. So then it gets it gets worse because you you're completely re re restructuring the talk, and then you'll start hill climbing somewhere else again. Right, um, right. For me, this that's is the way true. to think about it. No, that's true. That's true. That's uh, that was a good analogy. I, I can relate as a computer scientist. <laughs> Cool. So awesome. other people might not understand that, but <laughs> uh, if you're watching, you can Google hill climbing. <laughs> right, right, true, true. Do it. Um, it's fun. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah, so I've, I've got my timer. Um, it's six and a half minutes or seven minutes. I'm actually over seven minutes now, so I'm I'm gonna go through like over seven minutes, and I'm gonna ask you to help me cut some parts that you think is unnecessary. Okay, I'll just time it and then we'll we'll figure out how long your, your whole thing is. Oh, okay, okay. Okay. Right, sure. So. Should I do it now? <laughs> yeah, go. Okay. So, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
I'm glad that I'm here. And I would like to start with something very cliche, and that is asking questions from the audience. So I'm going to need your help tonight. The first question is, to all of the audience, how many of you here have ever moved in their lives? Maybe from a city to another city, or a country to another country for work or for life? Right, almost everyone. Um, interesting, like among internationals here, it's good to know that in 2015 alone, there were more than 250 million people living outside their own country. When I say the second question, you might understand why I gave this statistic. The second question is about how many of you have ever had to go to a new doctor? maybe to a new hospital, to a new physician or physiotherapist. Yeah, again, almost everybody had, had to go to a new place. But has any of you have ever thought about, hey, how is my health data from the previous doctor is moved to the new doctor? Well, this has been bogging my mind for the past couple of months, or maybe I could say even years. But it, actually, the answer, it says, it depends per country, per city. Um, but let's say, let's look at Netherlands as an example. It's a very good situation here. There is a system called EPD, where the health information of the patients are recorded there. And it is supposedly has to be accessible wherever you go in Netherlands. But unfortunately, that's not the case. Still, many places, they email those information to another one. And that is not a safe way of transferring such sensitive data. But the such such system also uh, is available in different countries like Germany or Switzerland, but there is a discrepancy. All these systems are only nation-based, so your data cannot be transferred from, for example, Netherlands to Italy if you ever to move or travel to Italy, to Italy. But, I mean, if you go even further than here, such system does not exist at all in majority of the places in the world. And let me tell you an example of a situation where somebody has to move their data or they don't have it with them. When us, me and my parents, we moved to Netherlands, uh, we had to go to the general physician. We had to tell the problem of our sicknesses from the very beginning until the end. And for the case of my mom, this procedure took months, up to a year, just for the doctor to know what was her sicknesses. She was already diagnosed with things like asthma. She suffers from asthma for several years now. But the process of diagnosing asthma again in Netherlands took her more than three months. And through this time, she suffered from asthma attacks several times. Let's look at asthma as an example. There are more than 300 million people suffering from asthma and 250,000 of them die per year because they don't have the access to the medication at the right time. Well, that was what happened during these three months. My mom is, is healthy and she's sitting here in the audience, but through these three months until she was diagnosed again, she suffered from asthma attacks several times and that was horrible. One moment she was sitting next to me healthy and the other moment she was coughing her lungs out going through something so-called as near-death experience. Yes, as a simple coughing could kill you if you don't have the right medication, the spray, in the moment you need it. And she used to have it, but she just had to wait for the doctor now. So to me, as a tech enthusiast, as a computer science student, this was unacceptable. I thought to myself, there should be a solution to this. So I started doing more research about uh, of the such systems, and I found out about EPD, what I just mentioned to you earlier about what you have in Netherlands. But then I also realized, besides the discrepancy, the fragments of the different markets in different countries, there's another problem to it. This infrastructure is very old. It's outdated. That means it's very prone to hacking. And there are hacking of such very sensitive health information happening all year round every year. Last year alone, in United States, 229 health organizations databases were hacked. That means 6.1 million people's health data was leaked. And that is not something we would like. So I thought, hey, there should be a solution to this. How come we don't have such a solution to that? Going through more research, I actually found out that European Union Health Commission has come up with their top three priorities for 2019. And can you guess what was 
the topest, the highest priority, a secure digital health platform that is accessible to all the people, wherever they want, right of access to the uh, citizens' health data. So that is their top priority. I thought to myself, how come we haven't done this already? Then I realized about all the problems that have been there with the current systems. So I thought to myself, what could be a solution to this? And doing more research, I actually came up with this brilliant solution. But before I tell you that, can I ask from the audience, do you have any guess what could be a good solution to this? It's a new te technology relatively. Correct, blockchain, thank you. Well, blockchain, it's, it's a buzzword nowadays. We might hear it so many different places, but it's usually related to cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. But that is not the only use case of blockchain. Blockchain allows you, to put it in simple terms, to store the data in a very safe manner, also in a decentralized manner. What does that mean, decentralized? It means that if your data is stored somewhere and it's going to be uh, maybe hacked or want, somebody wants to make an edit to it, it's not possible. Or if the server goes down in one place, your data is not lost forever. That's the case with the current system. So blockchain, among other things, solves some of the very major issues with current systems. And that is what I want to do with it, not me. There are many people who want to work on this. Hugh Delf has actually worked on this project just recently. This is something that we could do today, something that was not possible before. So politically wise, it is top to bottom. Now Europe Union wants it. So the legislation is going to be there and the technology is here now. And I believe that such digital health platform could save millions of people's lives. And you, together with me, we could change the world for the better and make a digital health platform a thing of today and not tomorrow. Thank you for your attention. Okay. How long was it? Seven minutes, 15 seconds. That was the first time I had not timed it at all. So, and okay, that's, I think, I, I was thinking I'm, I'm already over eight minutes, but it seemed mm -hmm. like it wasn't that bad. Yeah, that's pretty good. Do they, do you know uh, how they will time it on the day? Will they cut you off after seven minutes? <laughs> well, that's a good question. I should have asked it yesterday, but I think not because it doesn't seem to be sort of a competition in a super formal way that a hey, if you go over seven minutes now you're like disqualified I, I don't think it's that but it's good to ask yeah i will definitely ask this um yeah because i mean i personally i as an organizer i do, would do it like that because um, because because um, and I would tell, but I would tell people, I would tell them, look, if you go over, they're going to turn off your microphone or something like we're going to do something embarrassing because um, uh, otherwise people won't stick to time because people mm -hmm. always, and, and seven minutes quickly becomes 10 minutes, you know, and this is uh, uh, not, not really great when you, when you have a set amount of time uh, organized, unless they say we've got enough time. We actually schedule 15 minutes per person and we tell them seven. So even if they go way over, we still have enough time. Some organizers do it like that. Okay. Um, uh, or <laughs> inexperienced organizers say, we told them seven minutes, we scheduled seven minutes. Why is everything taking longer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, but that's, that's a very good point. I think I'm, I'm going to write it down here and I will ask them next time I meet them or I will send them an email. Yeah, cool. Uh, because if they do, if they're really going to be strict about it, then you want to, I think I mentioned that in another session as well, you want to get it down really well below seven minutes, I would say, mm -hmm. get target six, because you might, you know, for whatever reason, go a little bit longer uh, wow. on the day. And you just don't want to risk going over if they're going to do something drastic, um, especially because the very end of the talk is very important. So if it's cut off, if like the last two sentences are cut off, it'll make your talk like, it, you know, would really harm your talk. So mm -hmm. I would be very careful about running over time if, they, if there's gonna be some, some sort of cutoff. Um, other than that, I think it's really good. You've made a lot of progress since we last talked. <laughs> so, yeah, that's re really great. Um, there's a lot of things that you've, that you've fixed that we talked about, so that, I think that's really great. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it's true what, what the, your coach yesterday said that 
uh, it's not clear yet what you are proposing to do. Um, Cause I, I also understand it that way. And I'm curious if you know what the other participants are doing, because as I understand it, it should be a pitch for um, kind of a project that you want to start. I know that some of the, the people who are going to give a talk, it's not about a project at all. It's about their, their life oh, okay. story. Some of them were like immigrants or like third, third culture child, something like that. And uh, another one is about like, hey, let's, let's innovate in education, but it's not a project, it's just an idea, something like that. But I know that okay. one okay. of them is uh, already in startup. So there's okay. like very different types of uh, talks, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. In that but case, you know yeah. that, in that case like, I don't... Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, like uh, Mr. Jonathan Talbot, the guy um, who gave us the first coaching session, he said that your pitch shouldn't be a business talk, obviously. Like, it's not mm -hmm. a shouldn't be a business pitch. Um, mm -hmm. But also, there are going to be some investors sitting there, and they might, I don't know, be interested, get interested in your idea eventually. So, it's like, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well, I, th I think you don't need necessarily, if that's the case, anyway, you don't necessarily need to say, because you don't have... You know, this is not really a startup concept yet. At the moment, it's still just an idea, yeah. as I understand it, right? Exactly. So I think then just pitch it, pitch it that way. Um, actually, I'm, I, I didn't catch uh, or I didn't write down the last two sentences. Can you repeat the last two sentences as you, as you know them yeah. from memory? <laughs> so I said, I believe firmly that such digital health platform could save millions of people's lives globally. And you and me together, we could start changing the world today so i would like to invite you to come and join me and let's make a digital e-health platform a thing of today and not tomorrow something like that mm -hmm. yeah. i think that's pretty good um uh yeah because at the moment like i think you're, you're basically at the point where we can start doing some fine tuning so we can talk a little bit about that 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 ending, how to fine tune that. Uh, we can talk about the beginning, how to fine tune that. I think that's where you you can spend time on really sentence structure at the beginning and mm -hmm. the end. In the middle, I wouldn't worry about it because people will not remember it. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning and at the end, people will remember phrases and sentences that you say. Exactly. I would like to actually have like a phrase, one sentence that that if somebody reads that, they would they would grasp the idea of the whole seven minutes. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? It's like that is my the point of my goal if so when somebody didn't hear this whole seven minutes they read one sentence they get this is the idea i'm not sure if it's possible to fit that sentence somewhere in the talk yeah but it's a that's a, a good idea anyway to have um that sentence in kind of you can you know i guess probably they will also ask for a sentence like that from you um or maybe they ask a, a summary of your talk. Maybe that's longer, but that I would put a sentence like that, that where you can explain the whole thing in a single sentence at the top of the summary and then go into more detail. Mm -hmm. um, you can also use that sentence when you post it on social media or your talk and things exactly. like that. Exactly. And that's pretty useful. Um, so, okay. So we can start with that. What would be the, have you got an idea what that sentence might be? The sentences that I have tried, they're very long. Like I have not mm -hmm. been able to put it into like a 10 word sentence. It turns yeah. to a 50 word sentence. <laughs> Just, it's a long sentence. Yeah, so, so I mean, let's, let's start with individual words. So it's a, you, you call it a digital health platform. Yeah, or I think to make it shorter, you could say e-health platform with a small mm -hmm. E capital H. Yeah, it's an e-health platform. People, people could guess what is e-health instead of saying a digital health platform, so an e-health platform. I think that's good. It's still not clear what that does, but that's... Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that's I think a, a, um, a secure EL mm -hmm. platform, but secure is an overused word. And I think for yeah. the current infrastructure, which is very unsecure, they also <laughs> use the same word yeah. secure. Um, so I don't know how could I put the stress in how, how drastically more secure is this new technology compared to the current um, infrastructure. Well, I, I suppose to me, the word cryptographic captures some of that because but I think if you're not from a, any of a tech background, cryptographic means nothing to you. Like Sure. But that's, 
that's something yeah it's uh, you will anyway have to to educate people about what the, the it, how it works you know so fair enough Fair I think you're, the same is true for e-health platform. Like to a lot of people, that will mean zero. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, okay, yeah, true. So, um, but you know, so so, I, and I think it's useful to think about that. To think about well, what what might people think under e-health platform? Well, people might think that's um, maybe it's I can see my doctor via video call. Maybe, mm. maybe, uh, my, you know, there's lots of things. I mean, okay. Um, okay, so I think then we have to also kind of put in the the right of access to the to your health information somewhere in that it's a, sense. It's about it's about patient data, right? So patients' data, yeah. I mean that's why this EPD phrase has been used. It's, it means electronic patient dossier. Yeah. Um, because that is. Um, it's that's really what this is about. It's e-health platform could be much broader than just a health dossier, but that's what we're talking about. What you're talking about is true. It's a dossier of your health, and it's electronic. I mean, that's you know. So maybe maybe that's even a better word: the electronic health patient dossier. Uh huh. And may, maybe then. But then we are using a term that is already being used for a system that is um, a more simplistic version of what we have yeah. in mind here. Yeah. So, so then, you say a cryptographic but, EPD or like? Yeah, maybe, maybe it's um, or maybe it's an internationally standardized electronic patient dossier. Maybe that's part of it. You know. Um, and that you know that sounds also very old school, internationally standardized. That's like ISO <laughs> <laughs> language. Um, so, but that's, you know, that will capture some of it. And then, and then the other part is, yeah, talking about secure, about decentralized, maybe you can talk about blockchain. I mean, a lot of people know what blockchain is. So if you say a blockchain based electronic patient dossier, that might also capture some of it. Mm. Um, what about a cross border blockchain based electronic patient dossier that might capture more? Ooh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that, that basically grasps 80% of it, I guess. That's, that's very good cross-border blockchain-based EPD. I would always use this the full word, electronic patient dossier, because people will not know what EPD is. Definitely, yeah, you're right. A cross-border blockchain-based electronic patient dossier. Yeah. That's the <laughs> seven word, <laughs> not, a, not a sentence. It's not even a sentence yet. It's just a seven word of what this is. The thing. Like, yeah. the thing. Um, So redefining, no. <laughs> um, re, redefining health. Hmm. So I, th I think the other thing you need to talk about is uh, what's the benefit? So this is the thing. If the cross-border blockchain-based electronic patient dossier is the solution, <laughs> that's a mouthful. <laughs> um, then what's the problem? Well, the problem is uh, lack of um, standardizations in the way that data is stored and accessed, uh, transferred. Um, so and what you're really talking about is is improved health health for uh, the you know our global society. I mean, we're more increasingly globalized. We have to figure out how to do some of these things in a, in a globally. Uh, you, you, maybe maybe the idea maybe the the phrase is global first. Because because that's the problem, right? Because if you build an infrastructure for your city or town or or country, then, yeah, it's hard. It's to a new it standard among the so many other standards. You know the XKCD uh, comic about this, the standards. Oh yeah. There's 34 <laughs> competing standards. Somebody has to fix this. All right, I'm going to make a new standard to, 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 to encompass them all. There's 35 <laughs> different standards. Yeah, that's what we, we hope that we're not going to do this time. We want to make one standard. Yeah. Yeah, true. But okay, yeah, so, so you're, you're trying to define the problems right now. Well, maybe problem is a strong word. Maybe it's just kind of like the benefit. Uh -huh. um, um, you know, so what what is the benefit that this creates? Well, it makes, you know, maybe it, it's it helps 
improve global health. <laughs> I don't know, that's a very vague way of putting it, but. Um, improving global health for the ever increasing travelers and expats. <laughs> Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing, right? I mean, part of the, 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 the issue, like, you're going to get agreement from a lot of people on this, but, but not from the, the, the uh, anti-globalization backlash. So, you know, there's a lot of people who are no longer happy with globalization. And <laughs> um, there's this a great book, actually, which I read a long time ago, but it's becoming ever, ever increasingly true. It's called uh, Jihad versus McWorld. And it's about... Um, McWorld represents, you know, the Big Mac globalization, where everything is becoming the same, um, and we're kind of destroying uh, cultural differences. We are um, kind of also increasing uh, uh, inequality around the world, um, uh, and, and there's all these kind of negative impacts of globalization. Um, you know, free trade actually makes a lot of people in developed countries much less secure in their jobs, for example. Um, but uh, so, and there's a lot of, yeah, there's really a lot of negative impacts of, of globalization. And that's, that's what this author calls McWorld. And on the other side, there's Jihan, he's, he, he uses that word to, you know, from organizations like Al Qaeda. Uh, of course, he, back when he wrote that book, uh, ISIS was not, didn't exist, but now ISIS, we see the same, same phenomenon essentially. But he also talk, says there's movements all around the world and not all of them are so violent, but many of them are about withdrawing and going hyper local and shunning the world and saying we want nothing to do with um with the rest of the world and i think you know also when he wrote that book there was not this rise of nationalism that you see across uh, many countries um but you know it's, it's pretty scary when you look at um what's happening in the us uh, hungary um has a nationalist president um of, also of course turkey and uh, the philippines and i mean there's so many countries now where you could just say this they, they run with very nationalist policies um, some worse than others, of course, but um, uh, this is the reaction. This is what the author would, would have called jihad. It's about saying, well, globalization is so bad that we have to, you know, focus on what's, you know, the, the in-group and actually, um, you know, exclude everybody else. And it creates this like very, you know, kind of um, very damaging dynamic. And he says, actually, this, this fight between jihad and McWorld as these two kind of worldviews he says it's going to lead us off a cliff and we need to find a third way <laughs> because um, they sort of reinforce each other. The more McWorld you have, the more Jihad you have, the more Jihad you have, the more McWorld you have. And those camps kind of just rip the world apart. Mm. And so he said, we need to think about a, um, a new international kind of order, a way of doing business and a way of culture and society that, you know, kind of makes use of the incredible cultural diversity that we have in the world that uh, captures the value from that. Um, allows kind of globalization to, to, to work in a more positive human way, but also eventually you know, maybe erase, erases borders so, so we can reduce inequality in the world. Um, but these are all, you know, things that are pretty, pretty idealistic, you know, if you, if, <laughs> if you want to say it like that. Uh, probably it's even more idealistic now in some ways than it was when he wrote that book, because 10 years ago, uh, this was all like, yeah, people, we didn't have as many problems as we have now, I think. Um, so, so anyway, to, to, to get off very that tangent, uh, sorry, what, what are you going to say? Very interesting. I, that, yeah. that's, that's a whole point of view that I have not thought about it in that way. So, yeah. Very so, but so the question then, you know, related to your thing is you can say, this is, you know, for, this is for what you're building is, is for a globalized world, right? So some people will say, well, that's not, we don't want to globalize the world. Mm. <laughs> um, but but for those who do, or who at least some want some aspects of that, you know, maybe in another word, globalization maybe has a lot of negative connotations. But what about the word cosmopolitan? Uh, um, that has a lot more positive connotations for a lot of people, uh, although it's not as, also not as widely used a word. Cosmopolitan really just means inter being international or having diversity. You know, usually you okay. talk about cosmopolitan cities. So a city like London is, is cosmopolitan because there's so many different people from all over the world who live there and who kind of the culture in London is just incredibly uh, diverse because of that. You can, you can find people of any culture, speak, people speaking any language, you know, um, and also different aspects of culture, food, especially from, from any different culture that you might imagine. And that's, that's what you would call cosmopolitan. Um, 
And of course, cosmopolitanism is only possible because of, you know, international travel and uh, migration and all of those things. Um, but um, I think there's still a danger or there's still a difficulty that most people um, don't travel internationally. So um, the question is like, what is the benefit of, I actually just thought of one. So what's the benefit of um, making the system, not just for the, you know, those, that part of the global population that travels internationally or that moves internationally, which is, is I think a tiny fraction of the global population, right. but, but for everybody else as well. And one th thing might be that, especially in those, you know, you talk about the Netherlands has this system, Germany has a system, Switzerland has a system. They don't inter interoperate, but um, at least they have a system. And for 99% of people living in those countries, they're not going to travel somewhere else regularly or regularly enough. True. But, we, sorry to interrupt like quickly, but their system is very not secure and sure. they're being hacked all year long. Okay, that's that's good. So we are also addressing that problem besides like, yeah, making data accessible everywhere in the world and for the migrants and um, expats, but also for the people who are never moving, there is huge benefit as well. Because like looking at it long term, thinking about maybe like insurance companies or or maybe I don't know, any any bad person could abuse all this health information of many people because they're all yeah. stored in one location. What I had in mind was in this way, you decide to give access of your data to this specific doctor from this time to this time. So sure. your data will not be available to one health organization forever. Then mm -hmm. yeah. be there. And you know what I mean? So that's one thing that I'm also trying to address. I was not able to also put that in the talk because that yeah. would make it way longer. Yeah. Okay. But that's something but that's I'm a, really trying to solve with this, this idea as well. Yeah, that's a good point. And I, I think maybe one way you can say that is, you know, this, <clears throat> these, these systems are being rolled out more and more anyway. Like EPD, the governments are trying to push it everywhere. But mm -hmm. if you think that the system isn't secure the way it's built, then we better fix it before we have this massive rollout. Right? Exactly. Good point. Okay. Maybe that's why. Okay, then that's gonna make my talk um, seven minutes and thirty seconds. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll take some things out. Don't worry. <laughs> but uh, the other thing might be to say, what about all those countries where these systems don't exist, um, where interoperability is just too difficult exactly. at the moment? How do we ensure? I mean, you know, the, 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 I guess this is a larger question. It's also a question about your about your idea. How do you get people? Like, how do you get doctors, patients, you know, whoever to participate in this blockchain-based solution? If you don't make it required, if you don't make it the law, it might be very difficult to get people to participate because the benefits for most people will not be big enough. So I try to mention that, like, in a very implicit way, mm -hmm. that is, it's a top to bottom. So it comes from European Union Health Commission. It's their decision. It has to happen when they make it the law everybody's required to follow it. So right. it's not from bottom up, then you like, could you do this? Could you do that? Do you want to like join this? But when it's when it becomes a law and it is already like, there are a lot of talks about it. So I think mm -hmm. this, this is the, the, the possibility of this happening also in a, in a political way is very near. It's something that we could say it's gonna happen now since they made it a requirement for all these countries sure. of such a solution. So, so the question is, you know, what, what, what are they going to do? Is that probably they're going to do something that's not blockchain based. Um, and it, it might even be, it might even not be that bad. Right. So <laughs> optimistically speaking, there's a way to do this without blockchain. That's also secure. It's not that blockchain is the only way to make something secure. No, it's just sure. that, um, um, and, and, and there's also ways to make it insecure with blockchain. I mean, blockchain doesn't guarantee that it's going to be secure. So, um, so the, probably what they're going to be doing, what they're going to be working right now is, is something without blockchain. Um, uh, but probably it will also be, you might say, semi-decentralized. I imagine that they'll say that probably it'll just be a standard. They'll say there's a standard X, Y, and Z, and yeah. countries have to implement uh, their own version of that standard with you know, APIs that allow other countries, you know, that allow this kind of interoperability. And... Um, 
if that's the case, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't see necessarily a huge benefit of doing it blockchain based. Uh, of course, the risk is always that if it's on a one server, then the security of that server um, uh, uh, determines whether or not the data can be accessed. Of course, if you say that every individual patient's data has to be um, individually encrypted um, with, a, with some sort of security from the user, which uh, from the patient, which is what you would need to do in blockchain to make it work, then um, it also could be done without blockchain, right? You would need individual encryption. Um, the reason I think people don't do that is because you can't do, uh, do like any statistical analysis on the data set if you do that, right? So that's the question. Is the government or uh, is the EU, does they, that they want to also have this data in, uh, formatted in such a way that they can extract analytics from it? Because if they do, that kind of makes, makes encryption more difficult. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, that might be. But if not, then it actually makes it, makes it more or less trivial. Trivial. You don't have to encrypt. Um, uh, sorry, you don't have to um, um, leave it unencrypted. I'm just trying to remember. There was this story um, years ago. You know, when this all this NSA hacking stuff came out. Um, Google. It turned out that Google had been like, you know, hacked by the NSA. And people were super surprised by that, of course, because Google just, you know, of course, they take security very seriously, right? Um, and it turns out that the way they had done this, it had been f physical penetration. So they had um, tapped, they had found a, a cable, you know, that goes through public property connecting <laughs> different Google data centers. And they had um, put a, like, a, I don't know what, what it's called, some sort of, you know, device to read data yeah. of that cable. What? And <laughs> and and the reason they could read that off the cable is because it wasn't encrypted. Now you might say, why the fuck was Google transferring data that wasn't encrypted? And the reason was because it was within their network boundary, right? So when network engineers think about a network, they don't think about what's in the physical building or not. They think about the network boundary as being something like a virtual logical, uh, right. yeah, virtual space. And so uh, a, a physical cable between two data centers is considered within the network boundary. Also kind of makes sense, right? The fact that that cable goes through property that's not owned by Google and that somebody else could might be able to tap into that, well, they hadn't really considered that. And they had especially not considered, you know, somebody with advanced technology like the NSA, who obviously has the technology to do that kind of hacking, uh, which, you know, most organizations don't because that's extremely that's difficult. Yeah. Um, but, um, but that's... Uh, Google afterwards, as a response, decided to encrypt all the data, even within its data centers, wow. um, which, they said, which they said is a lot of work. Um, it makes the data center slower. But I mean, Google already operates the most data centers anywhere <laughs> of anybody in the world. And um, um, although Amazon might be catching up, but, um, um, but Google decided that that's worth it to us to keep the data secure, that we actually encrypt data even while it's flowing within the data center. Yeah. Um, and that would be probably a, a design principle that you would say, if the EU is going to implement a, a platform like this, it will have to be internally encrypted. There's actually a great talk by um, the C uh, chief information officer of um, um, bookings.com. Um, he did a talk about uh, network security, which is super interesting. I, I don't have a link. I also looked for it recently. I couldn't find it, but um, I'm sure somebody will find it if they Google uh, um, booking.com CIO talk security or something like that. And it's so interesting because he said at, book, at, at booking.com, they no longer think of this idea of having a network perimeter. They don't think of having an outside and an inside to the network. They think of everything as potentially on the outside. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so the question is like, if you have two servers in your, in your data center, which are communicating data with each other, but you imagine that those two data centers, you treat them as if they're servers on the internet, you know, in two different locations. So they're sending data to each other, which could be, you know, caught by some sort of man in the middle attack, right? So then they have to ask themselves, how do we try? And this is in their own data center, right? With a direct cable between these two servers. And they still ask themselves this question, how can we make it so secure that um, even if someone would completely intercept all of the data, uh, that they would not be able to read any significant information of that data. And um, they, um, um, 
of course, there's different ways, you know, like um, you do public key corrupt cryptography, you know, one person sends the key, the other person sends the data encrypted with the key. There's more or less, uh, that's pretty, pretty standard. But then the second question they ask themselves, what if one of the servers is compromised, right? So if one of the servers has been hacked, you don't want that server to continue getting data fed from other servers, right? That server might make a request to other servers to get data. And if the other servers don't know that that server is compromised, that server might have the correct credentials and whatever else um, to get that data. So, so how do you do it, right? Well, the way that you would do it is you would uh, have some sort of uh, checking systems where the servers constantly check each other for, comp for being compromised. Compromised. Uh, and if they detect or suspect for any reason that one of the other servers is compromised, they will stop sending data to the other server. Wow. Um, and that's basically what they've implemented. So um, there's, there's some more technical detail in the talk about how they, uh, they've done that, which is quite, quite fascinating. But it's, it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty, it, it makes sense when you when when you hear it like that. You go, well, that's obvious. Why didn't why don't other people think yeah, of that? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, but I guess uh, I don't know. Now we're going off again on a different tangent. <laughs> I don't want to distract you too much. No, no, no. But it's actually good good to consider those kind of things. But one of the benefits I saw in using blockchain, for example, was, um, I mean, I bet it is possible to hardly implement that without a blockchain as well. But it's it's inherent to blockchain that you could track where your data comes from, who made an alteration to the data and when, where, and like all these data will be like metadata will be also, what is the word like um, comes with the, the basic data. So if like you will never be able to edit somebody's health information, if, if you access in one place, because it, there are copies, millions of copies everywhere. This ledger is everywhere. So you can't mm -hmm. just hack the system and alter data of mm -hmm. one person or even. But, but this is not usually what's happening when you're talking about hacking. It's mostly not people trying to change the data. It's more people trying to get at the data that's right. uh, and, and exploit it for some, for some financial gain, usually, I guess. True, but I think both cases are possible. You're right. The case that you're mentioning is there is a higher likely that people would do that, but I, I could also see in a lot of situations, people maybe want, I don't know, change the, their health information in a system. You know, like where, where you see, I don't know, some people would want to hack Harvard to, to, to input their name that, hey, I was, I was graduated from there. Or su such situations do happen. They're not as likely to happen as people just want to hack and have access to all the information. But yeah, no, I, get, I see your point, yeah. Um, okay, but uh, we've just got 15 minutes left, so I wanna make sure that we use this time. So, um, um, what's your biggest concern right now? Um, that I do not make a big impact. I, I, I did not leave the people with a lot of questions after my talk. Like, good question, like, mm -hmm. hey, how could we do this, you know, like, or, not yeah. like, oh, he was too vague. Not that type of questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay, good question. So, so let's try, try and figure that out in the next 10 minutes or so. So how can you make more of an impact? Um, so my theory, <laughs> which I've talked about before, is the, th the, the, the way to make the biggest impact is to create an emotional story that people come along with you on. So you've got the story about um, about how you moved to, to, to the Netherlands. I had to get diagnosed with your things. Um, I think that's a good story. Um, I'm not sure that you're getting people to come on the ride with you. Um, I'm not entirely sure why. Uh, it's probably a number of different reasons because it's like, well, pe people don't, can't, you know, most of the people in the audience will not have had that experience of moving to another country and then having to get diagnosed again. Um, many people will, will, will not really be familiar with asthma. Uh, so there's a few, f few reasons why people might have difficulty really connecting to that. Um, there's, uh, there's some ways to fix that. So in storytelling, you know, one, one way that people get you engaged in a story is by introducing you to the character first before they start, you know, showing you like how the character is suffering or going through a difficult experience. So. Uh -huh. So that might be one way you might say, well, I first have to introduce my mother and, and tell some, you know, things about my mother that get people to relate to her. And then when I talk about how she almost died, people are going to be like, oh no, Nima's mother, we know her. She's, we, oh. she's important to us. Like, you know, so 
Oh, that, that is very, oh yes, yes, I could relate to that, like watching movies, even like if, if the story is talking about a villain, just because the story is around the villain, you still make some connections with it, and if something bad happens to, to the bad yeah. person, you're still like, oh shit, like, oh, sorry for the bad word, but yeah. <laughs> exactly, so, so this, this is... totally get your point, you're right. This, this is storytelling, you have to... And, and you know, some, sometimes if you if you tell a story about a person themselves, which already about them, you don't need to do that. But but if you're telling a story about someone they don't know, you really have to build that connection first. Um, oh yes. So you mean I need to introduce my mom into the talk earlier in the story? In sorry, in the talk. That, you know, I, yeah, actually that I hadn't thought about it like that, but but that might be actually a really great thing to do. Um, you you might even you know, sp you know <laughs> I, I can imagine that you might surprise people by starting a little bit different, right? So the way that you start now is you ask a couple of questions, which is like very common. It's a very common way to start yeah, a talk. Yeah, yeah. You you might try something else where you just say, um, you know, something like. We have to think about this a little bit, but so what, I, what I'm going to say now is not, it's not, it's not right, but in this direction. So you, you might say something like, uh, you know, hello everyone, my name is Nima Salami. Let me introduce myself a little bit. You know, I, um, I, I'm a refugee originally from Iran. I lived in Malaysia and, and finally I, I came to the Netherlands, you know, maybe some more details, uh, obviously not too long, but um, someone who's always been really important to me in my life is uh, are my parents. Um, and you mentioned, I think, your mother your mother will be there maybe your dad as well yeah yeah both of them will be there so so i will point both of them out i said i said my, my mom and dad in fact they're here um sitting there you know you can point to them uh, and you say look i'm so just so grateful for for everything they've that, that done to me for my for my life because actually it's just uh, i could not imagine how, how it would have been different um and uh, you know uh, Please, you know, it would really mean a lot to me if you would help me to appreciate my parents and show show me their appreciation by giving them a hand of applause. And you have wow. <laughs> um, yeah, because now with the audience, asking them to do something, and also wow, well, it, it's funny because this this is this is a, a really you know <laughs> psychological trick. But once they've clapped your 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 parents and including your mother, right? They'll suddenly feel like yeah, she's important to us. I mean, we clapped her, right? I mean, like. <laughs> um, and then afterwards, when you talk about this difficult experience that she went through, they'll be like, oh no, Nima's mother, we've, we've clapped for her. <laughs> she almost died because of this, you can't have that, you know? Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm part of the story, but even hearing it this way, I am <laughs> touched, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so strange how our brain works. Exactly. It is it's really strange. And, and, and so that's why um, sometimes we have, to, we have to talk about it like that so that we can, we can understand. So, and, and I think actually um, y you'll actually capture people onto your, onto your side as well a little bit more if you introduce yourself mm -hmm. and your story at the beginning. People will, will, go, uh, will be very curious. They'll, they'll, they want to hear more from you because they go, wow, that's a very interesting life story. I wonder what else he's been going through. And, Know, what else he's been thinking about that, that it will just pique that curiosity way more than the question will um, True. and do you think i should also in some way come back to that at the very end of the talk to make this kind of like circular connection yes so i had to have to like also make them i don't know somehow mention my mom or like how Mm. Yeah, you, I, I, you don't have to be too too strict about that. I, th I think your ending is actually pretty strong as it is. Okay, um, good. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, make it a thing of today, not tomorrow. I like that. That's kind of inspirational. Uh, you know, the, and these words like they become more powerful based on things you do earlier in the talk. So mm -hmm. uh, I would try with that change, make making that story more emotionally impactful, and then you yeah. might notice that the end just actually works the way it is. Amazing, amazing. Very good points. Okay. I really like that approach. I could try to practice that. Mm -hmm. and maybe a, a 26th version of my talk, I will send it to you and you could see again if, mm -hmm. if I could incorporate your uh, suggestion. Yeah. Yeah, so because you you know it's it's quite long now the talk so what i would do is i would say get rid of, get rid of those questions actually they take a lot of time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I and would... introduce 
introduce yourself, but the statistics that you brought next to the questions, I think were pretty good. So that might be a way to also give the same information without having to ask the questions. The questions take probably five times longer than just mentioning the statistics. Um, True. So you can just mention the statistics at some point. Um, and uh, you know, obviously not all at once. Like you, you don't want to rattle off five statistics after one another. Um, the way you had it was quite nice because you had it kind of spaced in between a few other things. You mentioned a statistic, then you asked another question, and then you mentioned another statistic. I really like that. So you have to figure out how you do that. If you don't ask the questions, how do you space out the statistics so they're not like boom, 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 boom. Um, yeah. uh, what I also like, you know, as is, is you mentioned, that these systems exist in, in different parts of Europe, then they're, they're based, you know, nation based. Um, they don't interoperate, but most countries in the world actually don't have any systems like this. I, I like that. I think that's something you could come back to at the end as well. That you say, you know, this would be, of course, great for us here uh, in the Netherlands, where our system, I think, is not secure enough. Um, uh, but also, it would be great for countries where these systems don't exist yet. I want to build a system that's, um, you know, open source that anyone can use, so that we can make this available to everybody in the world. Something like that. Mm -hmm. I also like the statistics about hacking. That was, for me, really, that really isolates the problem about the existing systems. There was a lot of the systems that exist, but they're just being hacked a lot. Uh, or at least the, the way you, I don't know if that's <laughs> those health organizations, if that's the same thing. I mean, I guess that's something a little bit different from an EPD, but still health organizations being hacked, that clearly is a bad sign. <laughs> um, and EPDs will be subject to the same kind of attacks, I guess. I also like the way you introduced the um, EU Health Commission top three print priority. What's the number one? You asked that question. I think that's good. Um, health, health, the health platform. And then you said, well, why doesn't it exist yet? The technical problems with it. And then the way you introduced blockchain, I think that's nice. Um, I think you, you, and then you mentioned talk about safe, decentralized. I think you, you might spend some time working on how to make that clearer. How do you, get to the point you know maybe you also maybe it's maybe it's that phrase as well the cross-border blockchain based electronic patient dossier i don't know that that says some of it you know mm -hmm. um and then you need to use it you know I, I think we talked about that once as well about what are those pr principles that are really important just safety yeah, yeah, yeah. you know i would i would really take like a moment take a, take 30 seconds to really say this is the most important thing it's safety it's thing you know and, and really make a big kind of physically and, and with your words, really put the emphasis on those three or four things, whatever they are, mm -hmm. uh, and that will help people remember. Oh, what's the blockchain thing? Oh yeah, it was about safety, about, you know, blah, blah, blah. blah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, I can do that. I try to make it a better, clearer picture of blockchain in 30 seconds. I found a lot of ways of explaining it. I've written like maybe 10 different ways, but mm -hmm. I wasn't satisfied with it myself because I kind yeah. of feel like it's quite complicated that even me after maybe months of research, I still feel like oh, yeah, I don't understand it very well mm -hmm. and trying to put it in a 30 seconds uh, sentences that yeah. is yeah. That's why I, so everyone is quite a bit difficult. But yeah, yeah, that's why that's why I would say like, don't, don't focus about explaining it like, you know, to explain everything, but I would say pick like the principles, pick the, what, yeah. what, are the, what is the result of it should be? It should be safe. It should be, um, I don't, I don't know if decentralized is actually the, the value or if it's um, what's the benefit of decentralization. Um, where where your, your, all your data is not in the hand of one person. So they could abuse the data that one, one group if it's only in the hand of, for example, Germany. If all the servers are only in Germany, then two things would happen. If the server goes down, all the data is lost for everyone all around the globe, mm -hmm. for example. Secondly, if a, a bad politician comes and gets their hand of data, they could just decide to sell all the data in one moment to one organization. But when data is spread, decentralized, everybody could decide if the data wants to still remain there or not. And if, if one server goes down, yeah. they have a copy of their own data whenever yeah, they yeah. want. So, so, so it's about like data loss prevention, that's one. And the other one is about um, data control. So like yeah. being in control of your own data. In control of your own data. Yeah. So that I would, you know, I would name the principles like that, like the decentralization, you can say that's how we do it. You know, we, so you could say the principles are, it has to be highly secure. It has to prevent data loss. It has to allow people to control their own data. And, you know, I don't know what the other principles are. And then you say the best way to do all of these things is using a decentralized blockchain. Blah, blah, blah. 
yeah good that's nice that's better that's already better okay cool so i think we're running out i think that you're, you're gonna have to leave that room any, yeah. any moment now um so yeah good luck keep practicing i think you have some things do you have any thank other questions so feedback no that was it for now thank you a lot for your time and the feedback much appreciated cool you're welcome so then send me the the next uh, take and uh, i'll take a look at it sure <laughs> okay thanks thank you